Good morning. Welcome everyone here. We're glad everyone is here today and we hope you have a good morning. <clears throat> First Corinthians 514. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded that One has died for all, therefore all have died. You know, we want the control of Christ in our life. And that's what we read all through scripture is sometimes we don't realize it. Most of the time I don't, that God is in control and we can't do anything about it. I forget sometimes that he's in control and I try to control things myself but we need to realize that um, our rest is not found in our control but in God's control his absolute rule over everything is who he is we will never be in a situation a location a relationship that is not under God's control. And I think we need to think about that. Even when we forget that God's in control, we need to think about these verses and think about him and think about who he is in our life and what his control means in our life. There's some announcements in the bulletin here that we need to <clears throat> look at this morning. Um, <clears throat> next week, Pete um, Wettendorf will be here. He's the new director of the Rocky Mountain Bible Mission, and I'm really glad that we'll all get to meet him a little bit. He's um, lear learning how to run the, the mission, and... I, he's trying to go to each one of the churches and try to meet everybody, so we need to welcome him next week. <clears throat> We're still looking for some um, ministry helps um, as volunteers. Um, we need um, some help with um, like the potlucks and the funerals and things like that, so if yeah you're felt inclined to step up and help lead some of those that doesn't mean that you have to do everything you just need to be um, in charge and get people to help and to do that uh, we still have uh, transmitters in the back if you're hard of hearing and um, can't hear very well the message and <clears throat> we have the transmitters that you can go in the back and ask Tim and he'll get one for you and they work very well. There's a men's retreat up at Camp Utmost and that's April 1st and 2nd. It'll be uh, Friday. Uh, we'll stay over Friday night and uh, then uh, it'll be Saturday and it ends with a steak dinner and um, if you don't stay for the whole thing, you miss the steak dinner. So that's part of the deal. So I encourage anyone that's even a little bit interested, um, get a hold of me and we'll try to get a group together, whether we can get rides or whatever. But it, it's just short. We'll be back for Sunday. So um, if you haven't been to camp before, it's a good opportunity to see what camp looks like and uh, what camp is and what they have going up there it's it's really good and also the shepherds conference is coming up and we encourage everyone to 
go to that if you can or just parts of it um, it's it's really a good conference in Missoula it's it's um, it says that it's for uh, pastors but everyone's welcome to come to that is there any more announcements that we have or we need today we're good let's open up the service in prayer thank you Lord for today thank you for all that you are in our lives and we just thank you that we can come here this morning worship you and <clears throat> be with your people and be part of who you are we just pray for our country. We just pray this morning for the Ukraine, the people that are there. Give them strength, and um, we know that you are in control, and thank you for that, Lord. And uh, also, in our country, we know you're in control, and um, we just pray that you would show yourself in any way that seems possible to us just pray for the service this morning um, pray that our hearts would be open and ready to hear your word and that we can take away something from this morning to um, feed us through the rest of the week just thank you in your precious name amen We've done this song before, I think Olivia and I sang it, but it's to the tune of Danny Boy, so everyone should at least know the tune, if not the words.
Okay, um, now is time for sharing. Um, if anybody has anything that uh, they want to share with us that God spoke to them this week or something God's been doing in your life that you would like to share um, to encourage others, that's such a... Um, such an encouragement to hear how God is working in someone else's life. So um, that's why we take time this morning to do that. So anybody have anything they would like to share that God's been doing in their life? Life? Berlin? Are you raising your hand? Or? Raise your hand. Oh. <laughs> Wanda? I just um, want to praise God for how he's given me such a ability to put worry aside. And all, I, he just constantly reminds me we have nothing to worry about because he's always got it. He's got our backs, and he's always in control. Even when things don't look like they're going the right way for us, he knows the right way to get us through things. And he's always done that, and so I have nothing to worry about. And that's really freeing. That's a good word. It's trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That's what it's easy to say. It's just harder to do. Anyone else? Karen? Um, as we worry, <laughs> we go along, we, we don't see p other people moving along like, we think they should be, um, one of them, our mates. And uh, we just, with Ray, God just had such a God thing happen. He went to Maui with our grandson because he had a, an interview with TSA, our grandson did. And we had just gotten back from Hawaii, but he flew back again with him and spent five nights. And uh, on the way to the airport, I said to him, well, you know, maybe you really, if there's a place, talk to Tyler, our grandson. Is this the will of God for him? If you can fit it in, he goes, well, I don't know. I just don't know. So it, many things happened, but one of them was, he said they took a, he couldn't wait to tell me, they took a little ride that went through the pineapple fields, and uh, as we're sitting there having something to drink afterward, some guy just comes out, sits down by him, starts talking about God, and how living on an island can be really different. And you got an hour in each direction, you can go and, you know, and just basing your decisions on the will of God. And I, you know, he said to me, did you know this guy? Were you calling him? <laughs> I said, no, but God did. <laughs> Another example of how he knows, we, I mean, he knows everything, everything that needs to happen, so amen. Anyone else? Now that row was really busy last week. Come on, Rosina. <laughs> no one else? Um, I'll share just a little. Um, Thursday at Bible study, uh, Drew was teaching us in Luke about um, the fruit of the Spirit. And I said, sometimes I feel like I you know, I've been in a drought at certain times, and especially um, after Jerry passed away, I felt like those first, you know, couple of months and stuff, I was just really dry and not bearing fruit and, and just felt, um, you know, just kind of closed in. And Bill mentioned something that just really hit me and made so much sense to me. Um, he said that when we're in those periods of drought, it's not that we're doing the praying, but other people are interceding for us and praying on our behalf, and that's how we can survive those things. And so that just had such an impact on me because I thought that's what the power of prayer is when we intercede for others and when we pray for them. And um, it just made me think, you know, we, it's so important that when somebody asks us to intercede on their behalf and to pray for them, there's a reason for it. And so thank you for sharing that on Thursday night. So, anyone else have anything? Nope? Okay. Um, be still my soul. Everybody stand, please.
Good morning. Uh, if you've come with high expectations, sorry. <laughs> uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Philemon, and it's a short book. With Pastor Tom, it would be a month. <laughs> with me, you're going to get it in about half hour, 45 minutes. <laughs> so if he's listening, which I think he probably is, sorry, Tom. <clears throat> Let's open in prayer. Father, once more, we thank you that your word is alive <clears throat> and penetrating, not only in our minds, and our, but in our heart. And so I just ask that as I share in your word, you would guide me by your Holy Spirit. And we just thank you that we have the freedom to enjoy your word in this country of ours. And we pray for individuals that do not have that freedom, Father. And we just ask that you would just be with them and increase their knowledge of your word and your love for them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sitting <laughs> because it's more comfortable. I, uh, besides that, when I look around, I'm used to seeing the backs of heads. <laughs> now I'm looking at faces and it scares me. <laughs> I'm going to read out of Philemon. It's a pretty interesting letter. And it has a lot of impact as far as the church is uh, concerned. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, Anaphia, our sister, and Archibus, our brother. Soldier and the, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do this, to do what is required. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart would have been, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while and you might have him back forever. No longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. 
If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay to say nothing of owning, owing me even yourself. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I'm going to open it up uh, with a little bit of history of Colossae. Colossae was a major trade city that was located on the <clears throat> road from Ephesus to the Euphrates Valley. So it was a pretty important city. Yeah. Uh, and Paul was smart. He set up churches in areas where people would be all the time. They would be coming and going. So the gospel would be heard pretty regularly in cities like Colossae. And Colossae was like 10, to 10 miles from Laodicea and about 13 miles from Hierapolis. And it was about 120 miles southeast of Ephesus. So we see that uh, it has a very important aspect to it. Colossae was also known for its textiles. And one of its textiles was purple wool. And we've heard about that in uh, the account by Lydia when Paul was meeting with her about how important the purple wool was because it was a color of royalty in the Roman Empire. The people in Laodicea, uh, they were uh, influenced by a lot of different, not Laodicea, but uh, Colossae. They were uh, influenced by a lot of different things. So when Paul was in Ephesus, he uh, formed the church of Colossae during his third missionary journey. And that would be approximately around 55, 56 AD. And he sent uh, Epaphras to be the minister of the church. And we find that the letter of Philemon was probably written between 60 to 62 AD. So the church has been established for about five years. And in that, it was established in Philemon's house. And when we look at the letter of Philemon, and that's what we call it, the letter of Philemon, but it was more not only for him, but for Althea, who was his wife, and uh, his son, who was... Uh, I got all my notes. I don't like notes. That's why I do this all the time. Because I always wind up losing something. But Archibus was Philemon's son. And the letter is for Philemon, his wife, his son, and the church to men in the house. That's quite a few people. What why was Paul doing that? He wanted to bring to the church a challenge, which was a great challenge during uh, this period of time in the Roman Empire. He wanted to bring a challenge that would uh, cause a church to 
accept a new way of looking at things. Paul uses the, the word prisoner several times. He uses the word imprisonment several times. He uses brother. He uses uh, my beloved fellow worker, my uh, fellow laborer. When Paul begins this letter, he begins saying that he was a prisoner for Christ. Uh, he was putting himself on the same level as Onesimus and on the same level as Philemon as a leader. Paul said, I, I do, I've been all things to all men. And that's how he began this letter, by allowing Philemon to know that he was a prisoner, a bond slave to Jesus Christ. He was bought and paid with the price of blood on the cross. And what Paul was doing was he was impacting Philemon with that look, with being able to uh, not only share with him as a leader, but also share with him as a fellow prisoner in Christ. We sometimes take the word prisoner and it means something different. I'm glad that I'm a prisoner of Christ. I'm glad that I was on the slave block of sin. And in that, a master came along and paid the price for me to be a slave for him. What a tremendous, tremendous thing that we can sit here today and know that we are free even though we are bond servants to Jesus Christ. When Philemon was, was listening to this, it was interesting that Paul sent Philemon, not Philemon, but Tychius, who was the postman. He delivered the letters to the different churches. And I call him the postman because that's, you know, you deliver letters, that's what you do. <laughs> but, and also, Tychius brought Onesimus. And I, I want to open this thought up to you. You hear a knock at the door, and a servant opens up the door, and at one time, Onesimus was that servant. And there stands Tychius, and there stands Onesimus. And the servant goes back, tells Philemon that there's two men to see him. And as Philemon comes to that doorway, he recognizes one person, Onesimus. What was going through his mind? What was going through Onesimus' mind? He had to journey from Rome all the way to where Philemon was, Colossae. What type of wrestling was he doing? What type of wrestling was he thinking about <clears throat> after Paul had converted him to be a believer and a brother in Christ? I know if I was on that journey, I would have wrestled. I would have wrestled. But I would have found out that through faith, God had already gone before me. So when Philemon steps to meet Onesimus, he is going through thinking about what Onesimus did to him and his family. We know that he ran away, but 
he also probably stole enough money as he, to run away to get to Rome. Most runaway slaves went to Rome. There was a lot of runaways in Rome. And Onesimus was probably going through, you know, he was hurt. So was his wife. So was his son. So was the church, the men in the house. Because there are, everyone probably knew about Onesimus. They also knew about him running away, him stealing financial uh, ways of getting far away from Colossae. Onesimus heard the word in the church. Uh, he may have been running not only from Philemon, but he was probably running from God because he did hear the word. And guess where he ran to? He ran to Rome. Well, Epaphroditus was in Rome and possibly recognized Onesimus and brought him to Paul. What a, a setup that God put in place. It shows that we can't run away from God. <laughs> he runs towards us. I was, uh, Wanda got saved in Haver, and we started going to Sixth Avenue Christian Church. I wasn't, you know, I, I was really apprehensive. I, I had given my life to Christ when I was 11, but uh, for 18 years, I went the other direction. I was getting loaded, going to church, and what was interesting about the church was they didn't judge me. These were farmers and ranchers, and I grew up on the farms and ranch, so I could relate to them. What drew me to God was their love for me. They didn't judge me for my habits. They didn't judge me for my long hair, my, at that time, a big black beard. But, and it's turned a little grayer over the years. But we, we can see how a church, if they accept you for who you are, means a lot. So when Paul was talking with Philemon through this letter, he was telling Philemon that, you know, you were hurt. Your family was hurt. Your church was hurt. But this young man, who I call my son, that I became a father of while he was in Rome, has changed. He is no longer a runaway. He has run to you. Not only to Philemon, but to his wife, his son, the church. And in that, Paul was saying to Philemon, you now can accept him as a brother in Christ. You now can trust him as a brother in Christ. You now can rejoice knowing that this young man is now in the family of God. It would have been a challenge for Philemon to accept that, but what Paul did was when he opened the letter he said, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith. Now when Paul normally writes, he usually puts faith before love because it takes faith to love one another as brothers and sisters. 
It takes faith in Jesus to allow us to know what that love is. So Paul was already setting him up, <laughs> in a way, you know. But he understood that Philemon was a person that loved people, and he refreshed the hearts of the saints. So when Paul was presenting this uh, challenge to him through Onesimus, he knew that Philemon had the qualities necessary to accept him. Now, if Philemon would have only accepted him by himself, there wouldn't have been much impact. And what we find, Paul says this, that the sharing your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. When he wrote this letter, not only to Philemon, but to his wife and his son and the church, he was saying to the church through that statement, you need to accept Onesimus as a corporate group. Because singly, Philemon could have went and said, hey, I accept you. But what would his wife feel like? She was hurt, his son was hurt, church was hurt. So they needed to corporately receive Onesimus as a brother for their healing. Because in accepting him, they also put aside and forgave him of what he did. Paul was the way that he did this is amazing because he could have used his authority as an apostle. Remember, he opens up with Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. He didn't say, Paul, I, I, Paul, an apostle. He asked Philemon, you know, he told him, I could use my authority to uh, really make you accept Onesimus. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to rely upon your love for this young man. And you are to make the choice. Paul steps aside from his authority because he did have authority. He was the apostle of the church to uh, command Philemon to take Onesimus in. But how would that feel? What would that feel like? What would it look like to the church if Philemon didn't, did accept Onesimus through Paul's authority? It would have been kind of a dull love. So when, when Philemon accepted Onesimus, there was a freedom within that church. There was a freedom in his wife, his son, the members of the church. It challenges us today as a church, as a body, when we have someone come into our body that uh, it's not what I expected. How are we going to receive those people? We have challenges today in the modern church. We have the issue of abortion. We have the movement of the LGBTQ. We have human trafficking, we have homelessness. If we had a homeless person walk into this building, how would we receive them? They may not look like us. They're not going to be dressed like us because they've been living on the street. If we accept them like Philemon accepted Onesimus, 
how much glory will God get as we do that? Onesimus understood that Philemon had the ability in the Roman Empire to uh, brand him in the face, which made a mark that told everyone he was a runaway slave. He could put him to death because of his authority as a master. He could send him to the mines and eventually he would die there. So Onesimus was, that was in the back of his mind. His master had the ability to take his life. But Philemon did not do that. He accepted Onesimus. He accepted him as a brother in Christ. It says in this letter, Paul says, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bond servant, and some translations say slave, but more than a bond servant, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. When he accepted him as a brother in Christ, it was probably uh, a relief to Onesimus because he, he came expecting, not, expect, not knowing for sure what Philemon would do. But through God's love in Philemon and in his wife, his son, the church, they accepted Onesimus as a brother in Christ. What? This small letter has an impact on us as a Christian body. It challenges us what decisions we are to make, how we are to make them. It challenges us because I believe that the church is going to be facing areas of this world that we haven't faced for a long time because the door has been closed. I think the door is going to be opened by God. I think there's going to be people coming in that need to know the love of Christ as Philemon did to Onesimus as Paul did to Onesimus when he said, this is my, my son. I, I would rather have him stay here in Rome and take care of me than send him to you. But I'm going to send him to you because Philemon was Onesimus' master. And in doing so, Paul relinquished all uh, ways of holding on to him. I believe uh, Onesimus may have went back to Rome and spent time with, with Paul before he was released. This was his, Paul's first imprisonment, which meant that it was an open house that people came and went. And that's how Onesimus was able to meet with Paul. I believe that Onesimus, uh, Philemon, probably had the ability to say, you know, you can go back and spend time with Paul. Uh, we don't know that for sure, but I really feel that that may be uh, something that, that happened and was... Uh, it would have blessed Paul. He said, I want, I, uh, 
in this, he, he said uh, that he would like to have his heart refreshed. So I think that right there tells me that Onesimus may have went back and spent time with Paul. This letter is so impacting and so short, but there is so much in it that he calls people his uh, fellow worker, beloved fellow worker. He does not ever come to that place of saying, well, you were wrong to Onesimus. He probably didn't, and with Philemon, he had faith that Philemon would do what Paul requested. That was, that was a uh, unbelievable move. We find later on, <clears throat> and a lot of scholars believe it, that Onesimus became either the bishop of Ephesus or the bishop of Berea. Through Philemon's accepted him and through the discipleship of not only Paul but Philemon and the church, look how much Onesimus grew and became a great tool for God. I think this, and another thing that I want to bring up is you really need to uh, read Colossians because it ties in with this. In the letter of Colossians and the letter of Ephesians was delivered at the same time that this letter to Philemon was delivered. It gives you a much more greater background. And what Paul was speaking about uh, in both Ephesians and Colossians, he brought up slaves, honor your masters. Masters, treat your slaves correctly for you have a master in heaven. He brought it to that place where now people understood. Philemon understood that he had a master in heaven and he needed to treat Onesimus as his master treats him. So I, I think I am done. <laughs> I, I hope that you got something out of this. I, I hope that it uh, stirs you up. Roy. Okay, I will. Leave it to you once more. I just want to thank you for the time that I have. I want to thank Tom for <laughs> the opportunity to let an old man like me talk.
we're going to um, have some time of prayer right now. And um, we're going to do it a little bit differently because it's the way.